Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions uh, with Awesomers.com with Steve Simonson. Hot off the press, Paul has had a big coup here with the OMG group. Uh, today we're going to talk about a court case that him and his team has uh, brought a few of the estates to justice, if you like. Uh, before we get going, Paul, do you want to give a little bit of background on yourself first? Sure. Um, thanks for letting me come on and talk about this. This is really exciting. Um, my name is Paul Raffleson. I'm a lawyer. Um, I basically, we help, our law firm helps Amazon sellers with whatever they need and uh, pretty much covers the whole gamut. And then um, in addition to that, I volunteer as the uh, executive director of a trade association I helped start um, along with a few other folks called the Online Merchant Skill which is sort of a first attempt to trying to get sellers to band together and, and be political and uh, be advocate, you know, and have advocacy in the courts and just basically, you know, take ownership of, you know, us as a class, as a group and, and fight for, for our rights. And uh, um, definitely uh, one of the coolest projects I've ever worked on and uh, very honored to have these opportunities to do these cases because they're, they're just awesome. So indeed um steve welcome to the show uh busy week for you so far <laughs> yes well as always uh it's fun to carve out some time but there's very little of it to carve out these days and it takes quite a big uh, uh chisel i suppose to to get that uh carved out but uh, i'm thrilled to uh learn about uh, more about this case or at least the outcome of the case i was aware of the case before and uh have always been an advocate of paul's and i can't wait to voir dire the witness about these uh, findings uh, in the spirit of my cousin Vinny. So uh, yeah, this is a, it's actually a very, very important thing for sellers to pay attention to. This is the kind of thing that makes entrepreneurs kind of roll their eyes or, uh, you know, they're just kind of, they get headaches when they, they learn or see these things. But instead of them just kind of going, well, I'm going to bury my head in the sand. You can see there's actually a way that they can uh, be involved and they can actually make a difference if they get involved with the OMG. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, I don't want the title to be misleading anyway. We're talking about price gorging. Price gorging is seen as a negative co like connotation, right? We do know that. But there's what I'm trying to understand from the 27 page document that you've sent me, which I'm on page 13 on. Yeah, it's probably best if you set the backstory and then Steve can start peppering you with questions as well, because I think it's important that um, when you think of price gorging and, and I, I react the same as well, is that you, you don't always know what's behind it and what these these officials are doing and what they consider as price gorging and how that affects sellers. So do you want to set the tone for the story? Yeah, no, and that's a great point. And I, you know, feel free to tear in, tear into me with, uh, you know, how, how could you possibly defend these people? They're they're so awful. I'm, I mean, believe me, that crossed our mind. Um, you know, and so to give you a little bit of the backstory, you know, you know, certainly in 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 the height of COVID, uh, this was a very polarizing issue in in, in the world. We saw some crazy headlines about, you know, just, uh, you know, people selling toilet paper for $700 on Amazon and, and um, all of a sudden, you know, just a slew of people were getting suspended online. Um, and so, you know, my, my law partner, Jeff Schick, who runs the suspension practice at our seller basics thing, basically was helping out sellers getting, dealing with the suspensions. And shortly after that started to flood his life, he was starting to contact me because suddenly a lot of his clients were getting subpoenas or civil investigative demands, depending on the state. So, you know, now not only is Amazon sort of coming after you, um, you have basically the government saying, Hey, you did something wrong. You broke the law. Um, some, most cases it was civil. One case I had to deal with was a criminal case in, in Florida. Um, and, uh, you know, so immediately, I just start looking at this from sort of a constitutional law perspective and just from a pragmatic perspective and just thinking about like, Hey, who's, you know, who's really responsible here? What did these people do? Um, you know, and just, it kind of really started to irk me because much like sales tax, an issue that many of you who've seen me before know I'm very passionate about and we'll be getting to that very soon. That's not done. Um, know that, you know, here's another case like sales tax where, you know, 
I think Amazon had a lot to do with the price gouging. I think I think that that Amazon's role in this sort of price gouging scenario, whether it was you know failing to turn off the automatic repricers that caused a lot of these prices to get out of the control, whether you know refusing to take action when somebody puts seven hundred dollars toilet paper in your store and you let that actually publish and create a panic in the national economy, uh, and then to sort of blame. You know, these small, sometimes unsophisticated, I mean, retail, a lot of these people were in the retail, what we call the retail arbitrage space, which in the U.S. is where you can buy stuff in physical retail stores and flip it online for more. Something I used to do, I paid for law school doing this. And um, it's oftentimes a gateway into Amazon. It's a gateway into private label, right? You learn Amazon, you learn how to sell, you learn Seller Central, you do the retail arbitrage. It's a very low risk, low, low cost of entry, low barrier to entry way to get into Amazon. And from there, people will maybe progress into wholesale and then, you know, onto private label or, or, or you know, just creating their own product entirely. Um, so it, it's a very powerful tool. It's a tool that's brought a lot of our clients out of poverty, um, but it's it's kind of not really well understood. And and so in the retail arbitrage space, we were sort of seeing these, these uh, you know, subpoenas coming out and. And, and just I immediately started questioning, okay, well, what was Amazon's role in this? I mean, first of all, they're profiting 15 to 45 percent, depending on whether it's FBA, right? And, you know, they could have prevented it, right? I mean, if they wanted to take proactive measures to prevent, you know, prices from being, you know, much higher than they were, um, they certainly were, were able to do so. They, they have price uh, controls. They use them all the time. Uh, we, we actually have a price fixing case against, not our firm, but another firm has a price fixing case against Amazon. For using it, um, you know, from our perspective, really Amazon does control price. I mean, they may not object to your price that often, but I mean, they had the ability to, and they actually told Congress this under oath in another hearing on antitrust. So, you know, I sort of question, you know, why is the government sort of giving Amazon a pass when they were sort of the sophisticated, the largest e-commerce company in the world, one of the largest companies in the world, right? They could have easily seen what was coming. They obviously did, and they could have taken, you know, steps if they wanted to to prevent you know, the prices from getting out of control and what happens when the prices get out of control. So if somebody's sitting at home and they see hand sanitizer is going for $10 a bottle, but you can buy it on clearance at the office depot next door for a dollar from back to school because it's still left over, um, you go out and get it because that's what your app is telling you, right? When you do retail arbitrage, a lot of times you have apps like Keepa or you're just looking at the Amazon website and you're seeing, okay, wow, but you scan this, right? It's, I mean, Amazon's designed for this. Right. You scan stuff in the store and then you see what it sells for online and you're like, OK, I'm going to sell that. So, you know, Amazon sort of broadcasting and signaling to these people, you know, um, hey, get as much of this stuff as you can because you're going to sell it for ten dollars. Right. We've already legitimately proven because we have all the sales data we're dumping on you. that This has happened X hundreds of times. So go get as much of this as you can for us. So sort of be like the Uber supplier. Right. Like you're, you're sort of supplier on demand. Right. Go get this. And that, that and. And then you'll sell it. And then, of course, when the shit hit the fan, for lack of a better word, uh, what does Amazon do? They start ratting out the sellers. So, you know, the states are saying, OK, and the states have no interest in prosecuting or, or enforcing this against Amazon. They all partner with Amazon and they say, oh, well, tell us who your sellers are and we'll go after them for price gouging. And so, you know, those started to trickle in. So the aftermath of that were that, you know, these regular Joe people, regular Joe and Jane just kind of not really sophisticated business people, people just trying to survive or getting these letters saying, you did something wrong. And keep in mind, a lot of these were related to things that were happening in February and January when our government was saying COVID wasn't even an issue, right? And that, you you know, so, and, and a lot of these states have like state of emergency laws where it's like, you know, if we declare a state of emergency, um, you can't sell this product above this price. Well, most of our clients who are getting these subpoenas First of all, most Amazon sellers who were selling anything COVID related were probably suspended by the date of the state of emergency. So they weren't actually even violating that part of the law. But the states were kind of going into other areas of the law and saying, well, this is this is un unconscionable consumer deception and just sort of creating these other, you know, for theories, for lack of a better word, uh, for why these people were in violation of the law. And we saw that, you know, Ohio doesn't even have a price gouging law and, and they're going after people uh, insanely aggressively. And so. You know, so, seeing that pattern. Yeah. Paul, let, let me just jump in for a second. So just to, to help frame the backdrop for everybody. So Paul's done an excellent job of pointing out that, in fact, you know, you have a bunch of uh, retail arbitrage, RA folks out there. They're buying, they're selling. Uh, that they, I don't, 
I, I don't see any of them, you know, uh, looking at this on a strategic basis and going, oh, I'm going to corner the market on toilet paper, hand sanitizer. They're like, I buy it here. I sell it there. This is a good thing. We all know and should have firsthand knowledge that Amazon, if you raise your product on your or the price on your own product by a buck, you often lose the buy box. Buy box, yeah. Right. And so the, the idea that Amazon is not complicit or even the driver of, of this kind of marketplace is is a crazy idea. So um, so on the backdrop point number one, I don't think there are a bunch of Amazon sellers in this context specifically that were scheming ahead of time to I'm going to get these people, right? It, it just happened to be a, a circumstantial scenario. And secondly, they're, they're, you know, airlines kind of do this stuff all the time. If, if it's the last seat on the airplane, that, that price is higher. But it comes right? down to negative scarcity. press. Yeah, but it comes down to negative press as well. Amazon reacts when it comes down to press, right? Right. So, yeah, so oh, obviously, when it comes to hand sanitation, don't forget they've had their best quarter in that period, and then they only sold essential goods. So ultimately, they don't want to cook the goose. To get away with the bad press, they've gone, okay, then you can go after these sellers. We still need to sell essential goods. I'm not saying that's the right way or that is what happened, but let's look at it logically. We had a lot of products shut out of the marketplace. You couldn't restock your goods into Amazon and send them in because it was essential goods only, right? That's right, exactly right. And that's, you know, they reacted over time like mm. everybody else, just figuring yeah. out the data points and going, you know what? We don't have enough people to ship, you know, this, uh, mm. uh, as, as Paul termed it, uh, the bejeweled avocado slicer, right. no yeah, less. And uh, <laughs> so we're going to put that on pause. Even a prime is a 30 day shipment and we're going to sell um, the essential items and prioritize those. So yeah. all this data was coming in live. I think that's the contextual point that I think Paul was mm. talking about earlier. Uh, you yeah. don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And I think we shouldn't miss the point as well is that when you set the price, that doesn't, you, when you've set the price and you move it up and down, that's when the algorithm tends to kick in. But there's still the opportunity for when you list for the first time to set at a higher price. So we've got to take that into consideration. I, I, I only agree yes, to but, an extent. But, but I, I will say, and we sent a letter to the AGs long before we ever filed this lawsuit. We try to be reasonable. We sent, we wrote a letter to the AGs. It's on our website. It's published. Um, and we basically said, you know, first of all, there's automatic reprice. Said, but you know what I found the majority of our clients and the majority of the sellers I spoke to is that, listen, when you get a, when you're in retail arbitrage and you get a big haul, you want to get rid of it as fast as possible. Like when I was flipping DVDs when I was in law school, before there was even FBA, I was the lowest price, you know, back when the buy box was much easier to understand because it was just, a, it was like a penny drop game, right? Mm -hmm. Every so often, and then you get the buy box back and you get some sales. Um, so many of our clients actually click the button on the Amazon Seller Central, and you're probably all familiar with this if you've sold a product that list, has other, li other listers, match lowest price. Yeah. So here they are buying this stuff online and they're clicking match lowest price. They're just trying to get rid of it. So you know, you've got one person on the listing selling the hand sanitizer for $100 and here comes you know, Joe Seller from Arkansas selling it for $20. And recognizing that you know, this person went to all the stores to get this stuff They in Arkansas at a time when COVID was definitely not a problem in Arkansas. It was a problem in California. It was a problem in New York, or it was starting to become a problem because I was in California at the end of February, actually, and really didn't feel like a problem then. Um, but it was starting to become a problem on the coast. They're going to these stores in Arkansas, in Oklahoma, where there's no need, and they're getting these things into the market so that they can get to where they belong and yet it's gonna cost more. If I live in California and I call uh, call you up, Steve, I said, go to every Home Depot you can in Seattle and Washington and get me every mask and hand sanitizer, put it in a box and ship it to my house. Are you gonna charge me the same price as what it costs you in the store? Or, I mean, are there already costs built in? Such as, oh, and by the way, there's this intermediary that charges 15 to 45%, depending mm -hmm. on whether you're FBA or not. So like, obviously the prices are gonna be higher. And in a lot of cases, our clients, yeah, they were selling for much more than the brick and mortar stores were charging, but not a lot of them were not even in this, these insane numbers we see in the media that, that but they were still getting subpoenas. Right. And, and, and now they have to there's a presumption of guilt and they have to prove that basically somehow this is a fair price because their costs went up. And, and it just it's insanity. I think Steve picked me up on this a couple of months ago when I was talking about uh, gorging on masks and stuff. And you're in the PPE business, Steve. You normally have terms. When you're ordering Ppepe stock now, you pay up front for those goods, don't you? That the other correct. thing is 
the other thing is as well with the was it the fires in Australia? A lot of the materials and stuff around the world, they've become more scarce. So the cost of the materials gone up as well as the cost of delivering of the product and obviously with factories. So overall, the costs have gone up generally across the board. Therefore, you have to set a new price in terms of what you sell it at. Therefore, it can be considered as gorging. But where does gorging start and finish? So to frame this again, we're talking about if we go back to the New York Times article, is the article the case that you want? Or is that just an example? No, the New York Times article was uh, just a well-known article. Our organization represented a group of the online immersion skills. We did not actually pick a particular case to get involved in. We were not involved okay. in what happened in the New York Times. Um, right. I'm you know, I've, I've posted that so people can read that article just for those who are not sure about the gorging side of thing. I think what I'm trying to frame it and get it into is that why did you go after these guys? One, what were the guys doing to suppress these sellers? And two, how did you win? Sure. Uh, three, okay, so, sorry, how did you win? so let's take it a step further. So, okay, so masks and PPE and hand sanitizer, mm. obviously that's a, that's a very polarizing, that's a very, yeah. you know, hot button issue, but when you look at what they're doing and when you look at what they're saying, we had conversations with AGs, okay? Some AGs were just masks and hand sanitizer. We had a conversation with the state of Kentucky and they told us, well, we think peanut butter would be price gouging if you sell peanut butter at a higher price. And, uh, but you know, we're not sure that if, if Morton's uh, or steak seasoning or whatever, McCormick steak seasoning would be. We actually had that in our, our original brief. We, we put it there. It's like, so it started to become more and more arbitrary that you know everything was price gouging. We were reading articles about how Nintendo Switch is price gouging. I'm like, you cannot price gouge a Nintendo Switch. Price gouging laws are about immediacy. It's it's it really works well because I used to live in Florida full time. You know, you have a hurricane, your house is blown down. You go to the 7-Eleven next door to get a bottle of water. They want three hundred dollars, right? You have no choice but to pay three hundred dollars. That is price gouging. It's that immediate need. You go to the Holiday Inn to stay uh, to stay the night. They want ten thousand dollars a night when it's normally ninety dollars, right? That's kind of what these state laws were written about. But they're all these states are trying to be, you know, these AGs are so arrogant. They want to make a name for themselves. They want to be on the front page of the newspaper and show that they're tough on this stuff. Um, so they all started taking these really aggressive positions, even when they didn't have laws, and started to say things like, you know, all, you know, do you know how many clients I have who sell peanut butter that, that they buy at like Trader Joe's for like four x what they pay for it? I mean, this started to become an attack on reselling because, and and the fact that the states were saying, you know, there's no state of emergency requirement for this law because it's a consumer protection law. It's like, well, okay, so you're basically saying that a lot of what we do as retail arbitragers in that community, right, is illegal or or even in 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 wholesale, right? I mean, if you buy something for low low and you sell it for a multiple, that's 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 duress and price gouging and Nintendo Switch. And it was coming from all the states. It was coming from Texas. It was coming from Washington, Florida, uh, criminal cases, uh, New Jersey. We had states going after people who weren't in the state. You know, we had Texas going after people in other states. I'm like, that's not even, you don't even have a right to do that because a person selling on Amazon isn't in Texas. Uh, we saw the same thing with New Jersey going after people in other states. So we just saw the mess. And, you know, we were dealing with Kentucky and we were actually going to bring the case in Florida and I had a criminal case. And I thought, you know, this is a great thing, case, you know, great scenario to bring the case under just representing the organization, showing that they've been, you know, they, but we were actually able to resolve that fairly reasonably with Florida because they actually agreed that, that they were one of the few states that actually respected that, you know, in order to, for our price gouging law to, 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 in order to violate a price gouging law, you have to do something on or after the day a state of emergency was declared. Right, which is how the laws in a lot of states work and, and the states that have it. Like we're declaring a state of emergency on March 6th. So after starting March 7th, you know, once it, once the, now the notice is out, you, you can't sell for more than 10 or 20% more than what you paid for the product, right? And and Florida to their to their credit on actually, you know, honored that portion of the law. And most states we dealt with did not, right? They said, you know, Kentucky, perfect example, they have a 10% price gouging state of emergency law, but then they have this other law that says at any time you can be price gouging. So, you know, it turned out, you know, Florida was okay because, you know, most of the people who were selling these products were suspended anyway before the state of emergency. So they couldn't even have the listing because price gouging is two things. It's, it's offering for sale. So just putting a listing out there in theory can be price gouging, even if nobody buys it, right? Like if I put a sign up in front of my store and say, you know, water $300 after a hurricane, 
and there's a state of emergency, just offering the water at that price is a violation of the law. So you don't actually need to sell it to anyone. And then there's the actual sale of it. But in the case of Florida, we would say, well, listen, if the, if the listings weren't even, if the listings weren't even live, if there was no live listing on or after that date, then there's nothing to talk about here. And they were actually pretty cool about that. So we looked into Kentucky and we, we got connected to Gary Ray's group and Gary and Gay Lisby, who run a great retail arbitrage group. Um, I can't say enough about them. Um, we've known them for a long time and, and Gary himself was caught up and he, he just did a webinar in his group the other day talking about how he was caught up in the subpoena, selling the stuff, you know, not at any, any type of high price, but, and, and to nobody in Kentucky. That was the other thing. Like none of his customers were actually in Kentucky. And then we got connected to some other folks in Kentucky and we just decided, you know, Kentucky is a great federal court district to bring this case because if the case moves on to appeal, the Sixth Circuit, which is where Kentucky sits at the federal level, touches Ohio, it touches Michigan, it touches uh, uh, Tennessee, So it's a, and which is kind of the hotbed for where the states were really going after the Amazon sellers. And this is also a hotbed for where Amazon has a lot of investment, right? Amazon just put like $2 billion of investment in Columbus, Ohio. So no wonder the state of Ohio doesn't go after Amazon, right? Just like we saw with sales tax. And same thing with Tennessee and the same thing with Kentucky, Kentucky, you know, Kentucky is to Amazon what, to what Tennessee is to FedEx, right? Like, I mean, it is, it is like the essential, you know, hub of, of Amazon's fulfillment operations and has been since the dawn of really, you know, their fulfillment, right? It was the first major expansion outside of Washington State. Um, so no wonder the state of Kentucky was, was, was reluctant and, and partnering with Amazon, as they repeatedly said, you know, and, and, and the AG is publicly thanking Amazon for their cooperation. So complete and and so we wanted to call bullshit on that because it we're, we're just tired of it and it is so unconstitutional so we decided that's where we're going to bring the case and um so we worked with the retail arbitrage groups mostly um to raise money because we felt like you know i online merchants you know we have money we're, we're we're still working on a tax case we have one that's currently in the courts we have another one i i don't feel very comfortable spending you know money that many members contributed towards a tax fight which is still ongoing on a price gouging fight unless they were comfortable. So I wanted to make sure that we could raise enough money to independently cover this cost. And we did, um, the cost of our outside litigators. Um, and we, we got connected to a great litigator, um, who, uh, just was a godsend and, uh, really helped us take our, our legal position and, and bring it to court. And basically what we went in for is basically to stop the state of Kentucky from going after Amazon sellers, from investigating them, from subpoenas. Like you can't even bother me on this issue, right? Um, and it was interesting because there was actually an Amazon seller that we didn't know about who had actually challenged it in state court, which is why the first 13 or 15 pages of this case is a little kind of strange because there, it raised the question of whether we even had the right to go to court um, because, if you're in the middle of a state proceeding, like a criminal proceeding, for example, um, you can't try to like override the state by going to federal if it's in state court. So the question was, you know, did the fact that this other seller that eventually joined Online Merchants Guild and became a, you know, and, and we, you know, use their information and um, sort of use them as an exemplar in a lot of case, in a lot of, for a lot of facts, um, does that preclude us from even having our day in court in federal court? And, and we actually had to separately brief that issue after we had our hearing. Um, and the court found no, and this is the judge we had. We could have picked a better judge. I mean, we had picked, but we couldn't have been, we couldn't have drawn a better judge. Uh, he's the same judge who opened up the churches under, you know, reasonable restrictions, you know, mass, et cetera. Um, and he's a big believer in the constitution of the United States, which is cool because that's what we needed. And, um, you know, and so, in fact, in the brief, I sort of made the point. I said this would be like, you know, the state of Kentucky investigating a group of churchgoers for one church and then saying because they're investigating one group of one church, every other person who wants to go to church in a different church has to wait until that investigation is complete before they can have their First Amendment right uh, to go to church. So I, I think it resonated. Um, but he clearly understood the, 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 the legal issues that, you know, being an Amazon seller presents in terms of it's just impossible to comply with these laws. And the fundamental theory of the case, you know, was a couple of things. There was a first amendment, right? Like I have the right to advertise a price nationally, right? I mean, if, if a price, if I put a price of my product on a Super Bowl advertisement and that price is illegal in two out of 48 states, those two states can't go after me. This is a Super Bowl ad. It's a national advertisement, right? Like it's a first amendment, right? Doesn't mean I have to sell the product to that state, but I truly have the right to put it through a national platform. And that's what Amazon is. 
And, but the main argument, the one the judge focused on that he thought, you know, this was just the easiest one and the one we wanted him to address, frankly, the, the other arguments were there, but really this is the one that we, we, was this idea that, you know, on Amazon, you can't set a price on a state by state basis, right? Like I can't set a Kentucky price. I can't set a Tennessee price. I can't set a New York price. So what happens is, and why this is illegal and why this violates our constitutional law is that if I am a Kentucky based seller and I have to comply with Kentucky's price gouging law, right? Kentucky is now restricting me from selling my product at what could be a fair price in another state. So, you know, another way to put it, let's say you're in Florida, let's take it out of Kentucky and there's a big hurricane and Florida says, you can't sell this hammer for $20. That's price gouging. Okay. But you know what? $20 might be a fine price on Amazon. People pay more for stuff on Amazon. We know that. Otherwise there wouldn't be retail arbitrage. People pay way more for stuff on Amazon. It's good for us. Right. They want that convenience. Um, but let's say that $20 hammer is like what you've been selling for or that, or, or is just a legal market price in New York and 49 other states that have no hurricane, that have no problem, right? So are you gonna tell me that this Florida law is gonna restrict my ability to put this hammer into the US market and sell it in 49 other states? Or that I have to sell it at this specific price that Florida tells me or else I'm violating Florida law, even if I'm trying to reach people outside of Florida, that violates a constitutional principle called extraterritoriality. That means the state's law is now regulating commerce outside of its borders. And for that reason, they were out to, to borrow from Shark Tank. So <laughs> that's good. They're out. Uh, so I, I, I first of all, want to just zone in on a couple key issues. It, it's the it's the crazy outlier story that you get about the guy who uh, drove around, you know, get, collecting all the sanitizer. He bought it for three bucks and he's selling it for 70 bucks. I, I saw that in some article. I don't know if it's this New York Times one or not, but that, you know, whether or not that's fair or right or wrong is really not the point that it's that story gets press and then you get uh, some outrage from uh, politicians, which uh, often have no idea really what they're talking about. Uh, we see that routinely when yeah. you, you know, watch the Facebook testimony and so forth. So they don't know what they're talking about, but they know they can get headlines. Paul talked about this earlier. Danny pointed out that it's all about the press. Amazon doesn't want the bad press. Politicians love to stir the pot. R really, they get their most FaceTime, and that's really all they measure is FaceTime. And they get to take a you know the high road, and we're not going to let our people, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, why don't you guys just shut up, get off the stage, and let the market do its job? People won't buy a, a $50 you know, piece of sanitizer, you know, a, um, unit of sanitizer, if they don't need it or if they don't want it. And we, in my view, I'm, I'm much more of a free market guy. The, the, it doesn't matter what you think it should cost because the cost, and I'll give you guys a quick example in the mask business. So I, I didn't ever expect to be in this stupid business, but in, in December, so I bought a company that had been in, in uh, PPE for a long time. And in December, the raw materials cost for this, uh, raw, this stuff that you make masks out of, was 2,800 US dollars per ton. So $2,800 per ton. So the, the masks that come out of that raw material are priced at X. Uh, by April, that same material was $86,000 per ton. And by the way, the other components in there didn't go down in price. The, the machinery to make this stuff went up by 10X. The air freight went up by you know five to 20X, it, right? Every component. So for somebody to say, and this is you know um, a possibility to say, well, gosh, I can buy these masks in December for a nickel each, and you want a buck each, is like that has no bearing on my actual margin or anyone's margin for that matter. And that's the point: is the market is is doing what it does, mm -hmm. and no politician, no state, no. Now I, I recognize the hurricane situation. The, those, there's a special time, right? If you have the only gas in town. And yesterday, based on the cost you got from last week, you were charging two bucks a gallon. And the day after the hurricane, you're charging 10 bucks a gallon. There's a legit beef to at least say, maybe that's not a, a great thing for the community, right? That, that's, that's for those legal minds to sort out. But the guy who bought the gas the next week after the hurricane screwed up the entire pipeline or whatever, the, the, somebody went to war, all of that is different. And the market is different. And, and my, uh, you know, my saluting uh, Paul and the, the OMG group and, the folks who took the time to put in some dough to help fund this thing, kudos to you guys on standing up for the individual. That's, uh, to me, that's the point of this thing. It's the big guys, government, Amazon, et cetera, the press even, 
they go, you know what? We can we can just kick away these little guys because what are they going to do, right? We we get to have all the benefits of press and blah 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 and the profit. By the way, Amazon, I, I don't think they refunded any of their commissions Not on any bit. of those sales. Nope. Yeah. So so they get all the benefits and they get none of the downside. It's the little fellow that gets the the thumb on them. And so thank you for standing up for the little uh, folks uh, uh, like me. Which brings me to my questions. What does the little folks get now? You've got this uh, landmark award, basically, for what you guys have achieved, right? I think, yeah, a bit of a Paul landmark. said he was going to send each of us a million dollars. Uh, Paul, I'll let you say it. Yeah. No, yeah, the, the money, it's not a money case. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely try to recoup our attorney's fees from the government. I mean, this is a civil rights. I mean, this is actually a civil rights case. This is this, yeah. it's classified as a civil rights case. And so there's an opportunity for OMG members to get the money back into the organization, which would be a great win for us um, and something we'll certainly be pursuing. And we've pled in our, our pleadings that, that we should be, um, you know, this is a constitutional restriction, but I just, I just want to echo what Steve said. I mean, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I'm not, we, we could have gone a different route. We could have, you know, challenged the entire price gouging mm -hmm. regime as to whether these are vague and hard to comply with. But we, we really just wanted to kind of highlight the fact that, you know, Amazon is a very sophisticated player in e-commerce, to put it very lightly, right? I mean, they were in a position, and in many ways, I feel that our members were, you know, misled. They were, you know, again, the automatic repricers, just, just the notion that this is the low price, you know. There's an argument that Amazon is the price, right? You can say, well, what is price gouging? Well, how can it be price gouging if Amazon sort of creates a national market price, right? It sort of becomes, that is the national market price. Um, but to the extent that there is, legal right to control price gouging. We just think that that enforcement falls on Amazon. And that's exactly what the judge said. He just said, well, listen, you can still go after Amazon. You could still make Amazon come up with clear rules or better methods, right? I mean, Amazon is perfectly capable of complying with state law. Now, if there's a further legal challenge to this case to say that, you know, these laws are just like you said, they violate free market principles, they're overbroad. Amazon can bring that case. They can spend the money and defend themselves, right? But what Amazon did instead, which is I thought was really scummy, was they basically set these people up. All the data was coming through to these people on their iPhones saying, go here, get this product, send it in or list it on our website. And here's the money you're going to make because we're, we're showing you this has been sold 400 times at this price. And like I said, many of our members were choosing the lowest price, which may still be higher than the price that they paid the store. But you know what? That's the cost of doing business. I mean, some of our members are making like five bucks a, a transaction. So I'm not sure in the grand scheme of like having something shipped to your house and not having to go out and get it or the ability to get something, you know, shipped to you from Arkansas that you can't even find in New York. You know, yeah, there is a premium. And, and keep in mind that just Amazon's commission alone is per se price gouging in a number of states, right? If I have to just take into account, like if I buy anything at a store, Right. And I just say, OK, I don't even want to make any money here. I just want to get this into the market so people in New York and California can get what they need. I'm a good Samaritan. I'll even cover my own gas costs. I'll cover my whatever. You know, I just I just don't want to I don't want to be out of pocket anything. Right. Like any material thing. So on, on a per unit basis. So I'm going to put this mask. That I paid, you know, five dollars for a pack of 10 and I'm going to put it up on Amazon. By default, the moment you list it on Amazon for a break even price, you're already price gouging because just to take into account their commission. Right. You're already over the threshold in a number of states um, of what they consider price gouging. So, I mean, the whole system, it was all bullshit. <clears throat> pardon my language. And it was again, it was just the government saying, OK, here are these weak individual people, these small little businesses that we can make examples of and look like, you know, we're earning our pay as government enforcers. Right. These these, these AGs. And let me just tell you how smug these AGs were. I wrote a letter. I talked to some. They were the most smug arrogant people so it feels really goddamn good part of my language to get yeah, this win it. and throw this in their face and you know this is a kentucky ruling if it gets appealed it'll go to the sixth circuit i really don't think this is a case that gets overturned i i'm not sure they are going to appeal this it's just it's it was it was plain as day obvious how illegal what they were doing was and we just called we just called them on it they didn't think we would do it you know they didn't think what is a little organization going to be able to do to challenge the government yeah, and so to Paul, me, I want to just make sure we put a fine line. So we've already uh, nobody actually expected a windfall. That was a joke. But there, there is a change in what states can and can't do as a result of this. Can you can you talk to us? Let's assume that the the ruling stands as is. What does that mean in practical terms for price gouging subpoenas? 
So it means, you know, with respect to state law, because there is a federal executive order on PPE right now, which I've had some FBI interviews on, um, which we've talked about another time. It's fast. That, that's all another issue um, and disturbing. Um, but um, with respect to anything else, I mean, really what this ruling says is that you're not price gouging on Amazon. So does that mean Amazon can still suspend you if they don't like your price? Absolutely. But they can't. The government is not going to go after you. The government, if they try to go after you, we're ready to do it ready to, to push back. And I think this ruling applies to eBay or Etsy, any of those, you know, quote unquote marketplaces where you're, you're really just a supplier, or, you know, drop shipper on demand and it's their store. You know, if you've got a Shopify site, that's a different story that, that you're going to run into some issues there. Um, potentially there may be some other defenses, but you know, for, for purposes of Amazon, what this ruling really says is I, listen, you cannot be, uh, persecuted for price gouging at a state level, on a state law, whether you're, it's your home state, whether it's another state, but these state laws just don't work on Amazon, the state price gouging laws, because they were meant for, like you said, the gas station after the hurry. That's what they were meant for. It's that immediacy, not something that you're ordering for, for, for 10 days shipping, you know, which is what, you know, based on the delay time, right? Like that's, that's not an emergency, right? State of emergency laws in general are only supposed to last for 10 days. That's the way they were written. And they were really written for physical retail stores, like, you know, within arm's reach, you know. Um, so but Paul, I also think, yes. Sorry, uh, just go on, go you know me, Am I to rant. <laughs> <laughs> on Amazon side, what benefits now will come in in favor for sellers? So example, you now know that the state can't come after you and pros uh, prosecute you, right, for the basis of price gorging. But what, what happens when Amazon now suspends someone on the basis of price gorging, can you use this case as an example in any way, or is Amazon being a bit more fair in any way in terms of getting back on the platform? Is there an impact on the Amazon side? I suppose I'm asking. Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, I think there has been. I mean, we've obviously we've seen a much less of a price gouging response. Amazon mm -hmm. has done some lobbying in the price gouging for a federal solution that obviously insulates them from any responsibility. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, but I think, you know, Amazon has recognized, I mean, I think, you know, whether they, you know, I know the states certainly shared our memo with Amazon. The states are all working very closely with Amazon on this. In fact, um, one of the Kentucky cases is really funny that, that they wouldn't even disclose the information Amazon gave them, which is, uh, oh. really, really odd. Yeah. It was like, uh, you can't get discovery the, on what Amazon gave over. Right. Like they, they the state couldn't make a prima facie, like just allegation because they wouldn't they wouldn't provide an ounce of evidence they just said we have it and then they asked for a in-camera review of the evidence that means the judge gets to see it and the lawyer doesn't the the opposing counsel's lawyer does not which is you know maybe in a mafia case like or you know in a giant right. rico case. right yeah not, they, not, how, how many people you whacked today paul this is an outrage i know <laughs> yeah. you're going after people <laughs> exactly the request this for amazon data that could easily be redacted if there's personal information i mean it was like uh, I don't think so. I mean, Amazon's not going anywhere. Okay, they're not going to go. They're not going to go hide in Mexico for the rest of their life, right? They're they're big corporation. Um, so, another, so it's kind another, of a joke. Another question right? for you then is: from here on out, if one of these states do, are they completely blocked from doing so? Will they chance their arm, or is there a point where you could advise anyone listening to the show and obviously this live? You know, if you get one of those letters, do X, Y, and Z. Do you ignore it? Do you? point them in, in the direction of this case, what, what would someone do in this situation? Or would they not actually start sending any of these letters ever again? So, I mean, I don't think this has made its way through the state stratosphere yet. This is still right. pretty new. So yeah. it may, you know, there's still cases out there. There's a case in Alaska right now that that got a lot of, a little bit of press. And so we're looking for people who are still being, you know, I've got about, I don't know, 10 or 15 outstanding subpoena cases right now in various states. I had a local council engaged in every one. It was, it was very burdensome. But we objected to, to you know, very particularly objected to these subpoenas. And so to the extent we hear back from the states, we're ready to sort of use this case. And, you know, I think it's going to be hard for, for the states to be able to pursue anything with this type of a ruling. It was so well written. I mean, this judge wrote this for publication. He wants this. This is a very well-reasoned and, 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 and logical ruling and it's a, by a very technical judge, you know? Um, and so I think that from that perspective, I think, you know, sellers obviously should contact online merchant skill. They should contact us if they get contacted, if they have, if they already have counsel and, and they don't want our help. I mean, certainly bring this to your counsel. If, if your attorney should know what to do with this. Um, yeah, let me, that, let me just jump in there, Paul. I think that's a very, uh, 
wonderful thing that you said, but let me just tell everybody out there, most of your attorneys have no idea what to do. Uh, I, I will just say that plainly, not because attorneys don't know what to do, but because they don't specialize. They don't have the background. They don't have the understanding. And this is kind of the same thing as I say about, you know, when, when somebody's uh, friend uh, is a hairdresser and her cousin is a, is a CPA, that doesn't make them qualified to be an e-commerce CPA. And I say the same thing about e-commerce law. I'm saying, not Paul, but I'm saying reach out to Paul's law firm and get firsthand experienced, relevant advice, not just kind of general legal advice. If you're going to sell a house, go find a real estate guy. You want to do e-commerce law, you call Paul and the gang over there. I think that's they're going to rename the firm Paul and the gang anyway. So that'll be easy to search uh, on Google. Yeah, we're currently in legal battle with Cool. One second. Oh, start. well, yeah, there's yeah. a little trademark issue. Yeah, there. apparently he wanted to yeah. start a law firm too. So we've got a trademark. Oh, there you battle. go. <laughs> yeah. Probably gonna get started. their royalties off their record companies. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, you know, two things I want to hit on too is that one, I want to finish your, your, your question, Danny, about, well, what does this mean for Amazon? I mean, I think for one, this sends a message states like, you know, back off of our sellers. So it kind of puts them in a position where they're going to have to look to Amazon for a solution. And it's, and, and the one we want is one where if you're going to, if, if you're going to impose price gouging laws to the extent you are, then there should be clear guidance from Amazon. Like if, if we're in a state of emergency and, and, and we need to abide by certain price gouging laws, then Amazon needs to tell us what the hell that is. Right. It, it can't just be guess and get suspended. You know, this is that unfair treatment. And I think that's where we're heading is that we want to see clarity, but I think Amazon in filing this case and even, you know, they may not like it. They may not like the rhetoric, the fact that, you know, we're basically calling them out as a store, just like we did with sales tax. And that this whole idea that, that individual sellers or retailers is BS, which the judge clearly seems to get because, you know, he refers to Amazon sellers as suppliers, which effectively they are. Um, it, it, they, they, I think they also recognize through their legal counsel that most of these price gouging allegations are BS. And so they're not so worried about the sellers. It's the press. It's all it is. It's just the bad press. So, you know, we're trying to change the story. It's been very hard. I mean, it seems like the media, you know, Amazon somehow gets a pass in the media that, that is unbelievable. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, as if every, it's as if every news publication is afraid Amazon's going to buy their publication, so they don't want to be too negative against, uh, except for the Wall Street Journal. I give the Wall Street Journal a ton of credit um, for their coverage of Amazon. I think they, they, they do an amazing job. In fact, Amazon sellers should subscribe to the Wall Street Journal because they really – um, do an amazing job of like covering the realities of Amazon better than any other newspaper. The New York Times, I think, is 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 you know thinking they're next after the Washington Post. But anyway, I digress. The other thing I want to talk about that's I think it's even a bigger picture and in, in why I'm here because you know a lot of people here don't do retail arbitrage, but you know what? Private label sellers got caught up in price gouging because if your prices went up, or your supply went up, your supply costs go up, right? You your prices you just don't get caught in price gouging. But the bigger one here is about online merchant skill itself. This was our first court battle. Like we started something in California and, and uh, about two years ago, and through that, we were able to get, was able to get the tax law changed. Um, but that was through legislative, right? So the case never went through. We have another case in California where we're suing Amazon, or sorry, we're suing the state of California and sort of Amazon at the same time to recover the back taxes that they're claiming the sellers owe. That's, that's taking forever. And, and there may be something coming online soon to, to sort of address the back tax issue for the sellers who are still getting back taxes, uh, threats. But the bigger issue here is like, this is what online merchant skill was about. Like, this is why we, we created it, right? This is advocacy. This is, you know, a whole class of people getting totally screwed by the government, by a company, and being able to band together and get a fucking awesome result. Pardon my language. I just, I'm really giddy about this case. I'm just like, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm with the swearing, but we, we are trying to keep it uh, polite. For PG, Steve. yeah. Just, Steve, but this was, Steve's not a big fan of my F bomb. So, yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> I actually don't mind. I don't I, uh, that often, but this, this was such yeah. a win for the community of Amazon sellers. Yeah. I mean, we, we fought the government who's been picking on us left and right. They don't protect us, right? You know, they, they do nothing, right? The Amazon has basically a, a state sanctioned monopoly because the states refuse to basically take any ownership of the fact that, hey, you know, yeah, Amazon's big and they create a lot of jobs, but, you know, you have, you know, 50,000 sellers in your state and they create a lot of freaking jobs too. And they're getting screwed every day. They're getting competed against. They're getting, and you do nothing because the all the politicians want are those, you know, nobody thinks about, oh, I created five small business jobs. It's like, oh, Amazon's bringing in 10,000 jobs. That's a great reelection 
uh, a FaceTime blurb uh, for my next campaign. So I'm going to support Amazon in any way I can. And that and that's the thing that really pisses me off. It's just how the governments have basically sold out every one of us as sellers. And so we have to fight for ourselves. And this is so normal in other industries, right? If, if something is bad for the beverage industry, like Coke and Pepsi, they're all going to band together, right? I mean, they're not always enemies. There's certain issues. It's like, wow, this is really bad. This law that the state is passing, like the sugar tax, is really bad for our industry. They're going to band together. They're going to challenge it. They're going to file court cases. They're going to go for legislative to attack legislation. Okay, the scientists in their pocket to say this is the right thing yeah. to do. And I mean, it's I'm, not saying they're, I'm not saying they're the ethical ones. I'm just saying, but the <laughs> principle of trade association in terms of like, okay, finding where we have common ground. Like we're not an organization. I say this over and over again. It's like all I'm not an organization. We're not like um, those other organizations that are out there that are going to teach you how to be better on Amazon. They're going to teach you. We're just out there protecting that window of opportunity that Amazon has, that, that the Amazon marketplace, the e-commerce marketplace has created. And we just want to protect it. And that we're just making sure the window stays open. But we're, we're not going to teach you how to be awesome on Amazon or on Shopify or any of those things. But we just want to make sure you have that opportunity to be awesome, if that makes yes. sense. So that's how we that's how we sort of can live. You want to you want to give people a level playing field to operate without. Yeah, we don't want to get in the you. right. We don't want to get in the way of like those, you know, people out there who can actually like help you grow and teach you how to be, you know, that's like we're, we want to partner with those people because we're just trying to say, like, listen, You've got skin in the game, and I've always appreciated Steve. I've always appreciated you for this because you recognize that it's like, hey, like I'm not here to like take your members away or take your, you know, we're just like this is something at a higher level about the playing field and just making sure that it's good for all of us and we all benefit from that mutually. And the more we can do this advocacy, the more we can lobby at the federal level, the more we can sort of change the dialogue. I mean, prior to this, we were working on. Um, sales tax policy because right now, I mean, for people who the marketplace facilitator thing has been great where, you know, now your sales tax is collected in every state but six. Um, the problem is now is like nobody wants to start a Shopify company. Nobody wants to be a $5 million seller on Shopify because if you talk to a $5 million seller on Shopify who's dealt with sales tax, I'll tell you, I hate life. I spend, you know, over six figures on sales tax compliance. I have a whole team of tax people now. And it's like a $6 million shot. It's not, you're not making that much money. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Brad, um, uh, yeah, it's Halstead Bead. They wrote a great article. He's a, he's a multi-million dollar shopping uh, uh, Shopify seller. He, I mean, just, he testified before Congress. I was down in DC before COVID, uh, meeting with Congress on this issue. You know, we're trying to streamline sales tax because we want people, Amazon's great, but a lot of people don't want to be Amazon dependent because it can be dangerous. You know, you want to be diversified. You want to have a good Shopify business. You want to have a robust Shopify presence, a robust Amazon presence and 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 you know a lot of our clients who even can get clients to Shopify can get customers to Shopify they'll have links on their Shopify site that just directs them back to Amazon because they don't want to deal with sales tax. I mean, how ridiculous is that? The ability to charge six cents on the dollar and give it to the government should deter you from having your own store. That is absolutely absurd. So we're on, you know we're absolutely on the front line of fighting that and trying to get that fixed because we we don't really understand why. A small business would need to be registered in 50 states just to report six or seven cents on the dollar to the government. Why can't it be one state? Why can't it be a central clearinghouse? What the hell do I need to be in the same tax complexity level as Walmart itself just if I'm a small Shopify business? And, and so these are problems we're looking at. We're always looking at the issues of the way Amazon sellers are getting mistreated, the way what's good for us, you know, because nobody out there in the government's looking out for us. Nobody out there is looking, they're all looking for themselves, right? So all the policy that's being made is being made by Amazon's lobbyists, eBay's lobbyists, but where's our lobbyists? Where's our voice? And that's, that's, and, and this is a great win because it shows that, you know, we can get our voice heard through lobbying and we can get our voice heard to the courts when our rights are violated, right? We, we have a right to exist. We have a right to be here. We have a right to participate in the marketplace. And, and we're, we're gee damn right going to protect our rights. And so I want people to join Online Merchant Skills and I want people to support this because this is for you. This, this, is, this is not a win for me. This is a win for the seller community. I, I'm honored to have brought this case. It's a cool constitutional law case. And I teach a common law course and I love this case and I love – I, all yeah, I need I now, Paul, is a little bit of Rocky music behind it. You've yeah. got me going already. Yeah, I should have worn my wah, -wah. Uh Brian has said, hey, Paul, Paul is a great guy. Saved me thousands of dollars due to sales tax issues caused all by the states and taken advantage of sellers like me. Uh, Kwasim says, hello, guys. Side B, hey, guys. Late to the party. I will listen in later. Pete says, 
uh what's up iris hey, says someone in one of my groups got dinged for price gorging for hair mousse on a 99 cent auction uh so that sound hello. criminal let me just go on record that sounds like an outrage yeah iris i don't know what to tell you. yeah 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 uh <laughs> Big shout to Terry the Fee, Miguel, Aaron Biner is back, Tom Bot's here, Kat is here, Giselle is here, Nanette is here, Iris Gloria, Juan is back, good morning Tiff, and Ryan Baha is here as well. Um, before we wrap on the show, let me ask you this, uh, unless Steve's got some questions of course, um, predictions, Paul, what do you want to see happen in terms of legislation in the next 18 months, be it sales tax versus... Uh, what's going on here with the gorging in terms yeah. of protecting Amazon sellers? I just want to see, you know, I don't know if I, I mean, I'd love to see sales tax legislation. And I know that there's, there's been a movement, but there's also been a reluctance in Congress um, to do anything because they don't really understand it. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the election and and who's, who's remaining. Um, I'm surprised. I'm surprised by the fact that Congress, the you know, certain Congress people in the, in the especially in the House Judiciary Committee, don't don't feel that there's an important need to move this stuff on. Um, but I just want to see more and more. What I really want to see is something that we saw in California called uh, AB 1790, which was a seller protection bill. Um, and and it's not a great law. It's not a terrible law. It just wasn't complete. And we lobbied really hard to get something passed. We worked with the Assemblywoman to get it passed. And I'm happy that it got passed because that's a foot in the door. That's a recognition, right? That's a state recognizing that, you know, ironically, it's California, um, but recognize that sellers have rights. And, that, and, and, and so, you know, for people who get 72 hour notices for suspensions now, I mean, you do have us to thank. I mean, you have the online merchants field, not me personally, but you have that because that is a result of that law that came through AB 1790 that, you know, and so I just want to see more of a trend either at the state or federal level of seller protection. That I just want to see that recognition I want the world to wake up and recognize that Amazon is really just like, you know, that they're behind Amazon. There are these small businesses that are just getting screwed over day in, day out by Amazon. Um, and not just by Amazon, by, by brands that, that are, you know, uh, trying to use anti-competitive means to, to kick people off. And it's just there's a whole lot of crap going down in, in, in the law that that's really just needs. And we just need to recognize the rights of the Amazon sellers to make a living because this is. An amazing platform. This is a platform that that transforms people. This is a platform that makes people self reliant. This is a platform that has time and time again taken people out of poverty. I have seen those stories. They are heartbreaking, heartwarming. Excuse me, and heartbreaking too because of what happened before. You know, and like, why aren't we encouraging this? Why are we encouraging a self reliant economy? Why are we encouraging more people to be self? It, it, it's exactly what it seems we want. It's exactly what I thought America stands for. But yet the government is not. I don't blame the people at the federal level for, for not taking action for, for a lack of want. I think they just don't get it because they, they're just out of touch with reality. They don't even know. Um, like Steve was alluding to in a comment I may make a lot of times in webinars, when you, when you have a member of Congress ask Mark Zuckerberg, how do, you, how do you make money on Facebook if you don't charge? You know you got the wrong people in front of the steering wheel. So you know, part of the way you fix that is you get uh, a presence, you get a seat at the table, you, you lobby at the federal level, um, you get plugged in, um, and 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 part of it is just you know um, you fight. I mean, we fight, if, if, and and we look for ways to to change the the landscape. So, um, but I, I want to see that recognition more than any specific law. I wanted to see that trend continue. That you know people start to recognize that you know, especially the states too. It's like, wow, we've got this community of fifty thousand, seventy thousand people, and growing every day who are self reliant in our state and are hiring people and why aren't we protecting them? Um, I'll tell you one interesting issue that that's, that's totally kind of an interesting thing for me from a con law perspective that I think you'll appreciate. The VA, con, the, the, these virtual assistants, not, not from the Philippines per se, but or just the ability to hire people from home. I mean, I, I, traditional state law would basically say like, you're gonna have all these tax requirements. The moment I hire some, so if I hire somebody in Rhode Island, to work for me now all of a sudden my company is in rhode island even though if i've never met them i'm just hiring them even fiverr you know like that, that company could potentially create you know problems for me so i could hire 10 people uh who all work from their home through fiverr and i could theoretically have 10 states coming after me for all sorts of taxes and regulatory compliance fees i think that's got to get addressed because i think you know we want people you know the work at home economy is here 
And I think the states are, again, out of touch with just the way the world works. And I think, you know, how can you start a business today if you're like, oh, yeah, I want, I want to get some help from this platform that lets me hire people from anywhere in the country. And it opens up the job market nationally. We're no longer, you don't have to live in New York City to make a New York City salary. You can live, and that's what Amazon's proven, right? You can live anywhere in the country or the world to do that. And that's the beauty of self-reliant business. But these, these state government regulations, these, these old-fashioned, old fogey laws, are going to kill this environment if we don't do something about it and start saying, like, hey, this needs to be protected because why the hell should I be subject to 10 different state regulations and laws because I just wanted to hire 10 people off of Fiverr to do a project for me? I mean, it, it's it's crazy. So I'll tell you, that that is something that I'm super interested in and, and want to potentially challenge um, because cool. we all rely on people from elsewhere. You know, we all get help from elsewhere. So, Steve, do you have any final thoughts here? No, I think the the reality is, you know, we're lucky that uh, Paul takes an interest in this stuff. Uh, as I've always said, you know, he's a he's kind of a major league hitter, and to to have him be so passionate and care about sellers the way he does is something that we should uh, uh, be thankful for and and also recognize him for. Yeah. Uh, secondly, we should pay attention that these issues are not going away, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't go away on their own either. Right. Yeah. Every time you get a, a break or some law breaks in your favor, don't assume that that was just some some politician doing the right thing. The, these guys don't know left from right. Honestly, they, they have in general. I don't listen. I don't know the purpose that they <laughs> are uh, performing while they're there, except that they ultimately make the laws. Right. And, and I'm not a politician. So, you know, they don't respect business people. That's clear based on what they do to us. Uh, and so maybe I'm biased. Uh, well, I'm clearly biased. Let me say that. But the point is, this stuff is not stuck in, in in neutral. There's things changing all the time. So whether it's the price gouging, whether it's the sales tax and California continue to come after you, whether it's the fact that California basically just said all Uber and Lyft drivers are employees. Oh my God, yeah. All of that trickles right down to us. And yeah. please make sure that this stuff may not interest entrepreneurs. You may not even think it applies. And you're like, well, I'm just a small guy. But this case that Paul just talked about is a clear example of the big guys going after the little guys. This is David and Goliath in every possible way. Make sure you pay some attention to this. And, uh, you know, in my view, you should be a member of the Online Merchants Guild, and that way you stay plugged in. And the one okay. thing I'd like to add as well, um, basically, and I've said this to you, Steve, is like I always say, judge me by my actions, not by my words. And I always look to the actions behind the words of people. And that's what I like about Paul, he's stand up, you know. So when he says he's supporting, because anyone can chat shit basically and say, yeah, I support the community because it can serve their ends. But Paul has demonstrated over and over again, it's done by action, not by his words. So Paul, what's the, what's the best way people can reach you? Sure. So, um, uh, Paul at sellerbasics.com, Paul at ecommentaries.com, or Paul at onlinemerchantskill.org, depending on what you want to talk about. Um, if you got legal questions, if you want to know, um, yeah, I don't know if I can plug Seller Basics a little bit, but it's a yep. great pro program. Okay. It's, um, oh, you'll like this too. 99 bucks a month. Uh, and basically you get to talk to a lawyer whenever you want. You get questions. Should I be an LLC or is my operating agreement good? Or, this letter just came in the mail and you want to talk to me or Jeff, it's, it's included in the $99 a month fee or, you know, 15 minute consult. And then with the sellerbasics.com membership, you also get discounts. So like, you know, when a lot of people were paying like thousands and thousands of dollars for price schedule suspensions, we were charging 750 for a full account suspension, which is very, very, mm -hmm. very low compared, especially since our, we actually work on these, like our lawyers work on, like we don't off, you know, offshore this to, you know, paralegals is, you know, we, we take these seriously. Um, but even better than that, and then we have a, a lot of our stuff is discounted basically when you're a member of Seller Basics and 99 bucks a month. But actually the coolest thing is, is, is because we kind of built this on like an insurance slash discount plan for Amazon services for what Amazon sellers would need. Um, we actually decided to borrow the vanishing deductible uh, concept. So if you're a member of Seller Basics for a year, 99 bucks a month, after the first year, as long as you maintain your membership, your next suspension is completely free. So wow. it's like a vanishing deductible. And that means, and when we say suspension, it's not one POA, it's whatever it takes that we can do. If it's within our power to do it, we're going to do that thing. It's, it's three revisions and an email to Jeff Bezos, a letter to Amazon legal mail UPS. Like we do it all. We, we don't, we don't come, we don't say, okay, it's going to be this much. And then, oh, that didn't work. So we need to pay us more. And then you, you would do this. And oh, now we need to email Jeff. That's going to be this. It's out. No, it's one fee, and then we basically spread that risk eternally and say, okay, well, some cases are going to go easy, some cases are going to go hard, 
Um, but we're okay with that. And so we, cool. we, we have that, that thing. So check out sellerbasics.com. It's a new program that we just launched right before COVID, but actually we've been doing, it's been doing great. We've got a lot of members. And I just, I love the opportunity to talk to new sellers, talk to sellers who've been in the game for a while, just for 15 minutes, sometimes just to check up. You'd be surprised what you can learn. It's, it's a worthwhile, uh, program so check cool. it out well look we're going to wrap there i've got 14 seconds because i want to upload this tomorrow without doing any edits so we're going to sign off now i'll see you sunday steve i'll see you next week paul thanks again for your time see you guys soon. thank you guys thanks everybody yeah.